triple or triple information so that it, like there's a shot in uh, pickpocket where the, the pickpocket you see him right in the journal you see the words I went into a bank and sat down then you hear him say that I went into a bank and sat down and then you see him go into a bank and sit down now this violates what movies do movies don't movies don't do this so what is that director up to when he's violating these basic rules? Well, he's trying to throw you off. He's trying to reject why you went to the movies in the first place. He said, I, you came to see a certain thing, and I'm going to keep you in the movie by doing some interesting things. Maybe my character is a criminal. Maybe it's a kind of a family drama. But I'm going to push you away whenever you expect me to come at you. I'm going to step away from you. And the goal of such a technique, such a, a towel, such a path, is to get to a point where you have a revelation and the viewer then makes the step forward. The viewer steps into the void because I don't believe that there is such a thing as holy art. I mean, there is things, a sculpture, but this is not holy, this is just an object. What is holy is the space between this object and that observer. And when that observer starts to come toward the object in that area, in that aura, and what some philosophers called uh, that transfiguration, then a kind of spirituality and holiness can exist. And what these filmmakers who try to use movies against their own best in qualities, they are trying to create that kind of process. Um, it's not easy. And it's very hard to sort of explain. But when you see it and when you feel it, you realize you know, this is the real deal. This is actually how it works. And you get that same kind of buzz that you might get at a holy place, you know, sitting up at Machu Picchu or whatever it is, and as the sun rises, and also you feel the presence of something other than yourself. Well, th that's what they're trying to do uh, in, in uh, films like this. And if you haven't seen any of these films, I would start off, the two to start off with would be uh, Diary of a Country Priest, Priest or Pickpocket by Bresson, Tokyo Story by Ozu. Tokyo Story and Country Priest are both out on Criterion. I just did an introduction to Pickpocket for Criterion, which hasn't come out yet. Um, and. Uh, uh, that, I think, is, 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 is a, some way you can try to get spirituality in film, even though film resists the very, the very notion. And, and, and trying to create spirituality in film, which I do not believe I have ever tried to do, uh, is as hard as, of course, trying to create spirituality in life. Emotional identification is much easier, much easier to go to passion and feel sad or cry than it is to deal with, uh, with, with the, 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 the transcendent and your relationship to it. Uh, so I, I was tempted to uh, bring some clips because, you know, that's sort of what's expected from directors that show, they show clips. But uh, I was thinking, you know, what, what could I show, you know, I, you know show Jesus getting beat up. And then show, uh, you know, we're dead with these, these dour Protestants just sitting there. Or, the, or show the last shot of Tokyo Story, which is nothing more than a long shot of a boat going up a river. So it's, it's very hard to, to show this kind of stuff in clips because it is a process that occurs uh, over time. So those are my remarks. Uh, a little shorter than I thought, but that's good. We have a little more time for uh, uh, Q and A. I don't know whether you want to.
take a break or jump right in or whatever. Microphone's on here in the back, so make sure if you do come up and speak, keep your mouth really close to this one, otherwise no one will hear you. Paul, thank you so much for your comments. Um, you touched a lot on the passion of the Christ, and I wondered if you could talk a little, a little more about that. Specifically, one thing I'm interested in is how evangelical audiences embraced it with the same fury that they rejected the temp last temptation of Christ. Well, I'm sure you've got thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, a number of thoughts. Uh, the passion, it, you know, there's a political, there's a political, there's a spiritual, there's an artistic quotient in all of this. Uh, the political one for Mel is that he absolutely worked that community. You know, he spent five months slapping his ass from one church to another all through the South and the West showing that movie. So he built that constituency. And it was, by the time that film opened, it was seen as an insider's film. It was seen as our film. And so, so that really changed the identity of the film. A uh, film like Last Temptation Woman was always seen as a dirty Jew film, you know. Uh, as the, you know, the Protestants who protested outside Lou Wasserman's house because he was Jewish, you know. Uh, so, you know, that's an element to it. There's also uh, the element of the culture wars, which we're in the thick of now. And it became a question of whose side are you on? You know, uh, and one of the ugliest aspects to the current presidential race is, uh, is this introduction of religion uh, into, uh, you know, the political race. God, you know, Bush is on God's team, therefore God must be on Bush's team. Uh, and so seeing the passion became a, a cultural artifact, a statement of which team you belong to. So there was that element as well. And then, of course, uh, the fact that it um, was so medieval. I mean, you know, welcome to the 14th century. Uh, welcome, you know, Mel says he has a problem, you know, with Vatican II. I, I think he has a problem with the Enlightenment. Uh, you know, uh, this really goes back to a medieval world of, of blood cult and blood guilt and expiation. And, uh, and it is very, very uh, uh, primitive. And it's, you know, that to me is the disturbing thing about the film, not, uh, 
Not that it's a, you know, a, you know, kind of religious art. I, I don't mind that at all. But it, what, what disturbs me is, is, is the kind. Uh, there's a mean, there's an angry spiritedness in it, which comes from Gibson himself, who's not. You know, who is Braveheart in many ways? You know, go see his, his latest film he's produced, which is the Paparazzi, where they, you know, which is sort of, uh, he, he hates Paparazzi. He just produced a movie which opened on Friday, which is um, 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 a death wish where a guy goes out and shoots pap Paparazzi. Uh, so there, there is a kind of mean spiritism and, and anger in there uh, that, uh, you know, who would have thought I'm a, went to college in the 60s. Who would have thought that in the year 2004, we would be fighting uh, a return to religious fundamentalism and exclusionary uh, faith? But here we are. And, uh, and uh, a film like Mel's film feeds right into that. And it becomes a part of a culture war. You know, just like gay, like gay marriage. I mean, who really is threatened by gay marriage? Who's threatened by flag burning? Yet, you know, maybe these become totems by which we divide society. Um, hi, I I want to do a, a kind of get a little deeper into something you were talking about in the first half of your lecture. In in that spirituality needs to be, in a way, divorced from temporality. That that the experience of time passing somehow uh, pr prevents uh, a spiritual experience from happening. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I said the opposite. That spirituality is a Tao, is a path, and that the best art to convey it is, a be is an art that exists through time. That the arts that, that are frozen in time, like sculpture or painting, are less equipped than arts that exist in time, like architecture, where you walk through the art object of art itself. So I said the opposite, which is time is on the side of spirituality. But didn't you go on to say then that part of the reason that movies are so poor at representing a spiritual experience is because they represent reality, uh, the everyday? Yeah. Because they're, because they're photographs, because they're physical resemblance of, of human beings, of, of people we know and who we have very human feelings about. Uh, the, and the, the fact that they do it over time, of course, intensifies that emotional connection. But also, it's the fact that movies operate in time that allows certain directors to use movies to, to slowly wear down what you expect. OK. Well, I guess my question then is, doesn't that, isn't an assumption of your argument that a spiritual experience needs to be um, one in which God is transcendent as opposed to imminent? In other words, that if you conceive of a God that's simultaneous with the universe and not apart from the universe, then a spiritual experience, in the latter case, a spiritual experience would need to be representative of ordinary reality. And I guess the reason, I mean, what occurred to me immediately while you were talking was like some of early, some of the early films by like Werner Herzog, like say, A Glory Wrath of God, mm -hmm. which even though ostensibly having nothing to do with a transcendental reality whatsoever, in a way almost create a spiritual experience only of an imminent uh, variety. Um, and you know, I, I almost think a movie you wrote, like The Last Temptation of Christ, <laughs> at points, even though it, you know, the, the screenplay deals with a transcendent figure, Christ, in a way, almost becomes a spiritual experience of the imminent variety when it's successful. Yeah, I mean, The Last Temptation, of course, is a very humanistic film. It's about. Uh the struggle of, uh, uh, of, of, of man toward God. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. I, I don't know quite what the answer is, how to respond to this notion of eminence versus transcendence. Um, I guess, I, you know, I was so inculcated by the 
Rudolf Otto notion of the holy other and, 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 and the fact that God can only be defined by not being anything we are, that I guess I n never have really signed on to the, <laughs> to, to the, the eminence uh, uh, crowd. So I, I can't answer that with any, with any clarity. Uh, I'll jump over to something with the uh, last temptation, which was interesting, though. Um, last temptation, we know, was accused of uh, blasphemy, uh, which was not quite the right word. Uh, what they were thinking of was, was sacrilege. And it was uh, basically because it emphasized the fact that uh, Jesus had uh, you know, sexual needs. That this this was this was sacrilegious, but they called it blasphemy, which was sort of interesting. And in a way, it was blasphemous, but it was a blasphemous in a way that nobody, that none of the opponents understood because they were mounting a social argument. Katanzakis, in his novel, uses Christ, Jesus, as a metaphor for the human struggle for holiness. And I guess. If you use Christ as a metaphor, that's blasphemy. So in fact, it probably was blasphemous. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi, I was just uh, going to ask, you mentioned earlier that you haven't actually made any spiritual films on your own accord, but uh, after watching Bringing Out the Dead and hearing your description of how uh, spiritual movies are contemplative and very low-key and push against audience expectation. That seemed to be a film that really kind of went along those lines. And uh, did you think that Scorsese didn't, did a relatively good job of attempting a spiritual film? Yeah, yeah he's talking about bringing out the dead. Uh, I, I think Marty did a good job. I think he miscast the movie, you know, which in the end killed it, you know, because Nick was just too old, Nick Cage. Uh, you know, if you're going to have a nervous breakdown as a paramedic, you have that breakdown in your early 20s. You don't have it in your mid-30s. And there's no way that Nick could ever get around that fact. He was just too old to play that role. Uh, but, uh, and, and uh, I did a film I like a lot called Light Sleeper, which is about the, you know, the midlife crisis of a drug dealer. And, uh, you know, what a better figure to, um, to you know, send to heaven to send through the open door, you know. I love this idea of, of taking the most vilified character in our culture, the drug dealer, and giving him a midlife crisis and redeeming him in, uh, in this way. So yes, I, I fool around in that area, but I never, ever try these hardcore aesthetic, uh, that's A-S-C-E-T-I-C, these hardcore ascetic devices that it's really necessary if you're going to slow people down. Hi, I wanted to ask about uh, if you had any opinions about the films of Lars von Trier, uh, as how they may, might relate to Carl Dreyer's films, and whether or not they um, create that environment for somebody to make a step towards the film, how successful they are at that. I'm not a big fan of his work. I've only seen uh, Breaking the Waves, Kingdom Come, and now Dogville. Uh, you know, they're full of imagination. Um, I find them somewhat more clever, more clever than, than anything else. Uh, and, and particularly Dogville, there's a tremendous performance by Nicole Kidman. I think the best performance she ever gave. But it's just too, just too clever, and and it's not at all what Dreyer was up to. You know, Dreyer was 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 you know. I mean, you know, if Carl Dreyer.